six euros. More than <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> Need to get one. <laughs> I see. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I see. I see. That's nice. I see. It's about 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes from the train station to, to the department. Yeah. That's where you were, right? No. Where, where, where? Oh no, you were in Chai, right? Before here, you oh, were in Chai, Chai, yeah. yes. Chai is north compared to Tainan, right? Right. A little bit north, yeah. About Halfway, or? No, 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 it's about 50 kilometers. Only 50 kilometers, oh, I forgot. So it's quite close to Tainan. Oh, 50 kilometers from Tainan, I see. How okay. yeah, about from here? Uh, 250. Oh, I see, I see. Also, they're very close. I mean, uh, uh, it's like almost, I mean, from compared to here, it's almost, uh, they're very close, I see. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Paolo Cassini. Uh, so as you know, that Paolo Cassini is one of the <laughs> one of the author of the very famous paper BCHM, and uh, also he is the NCT scholar, which means that he will be visit visiting here uh, on a regular basis. So, for example, uh, this year he he's going to be here, starting from yesterday and and stay here for almost a month. So if you have any question or you have any proposal, then you are free to yeah, talk to him to have more interaction with uh, Professor Paolo Cassini. So um, this year we are very <coughs> happy to have Professor Cassini to talk about, uh, to give a series of, uh, of the recent progress. And he's going to give uh, three lectures starting from this Friday. So it's going to be this Friday, next Friday, and uh, two weeks from now. And so there are going to be three lectures. And the main course is on bidirectional geometry of foliations on high dimensional varieties. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much. Thanks. And I'm very happy to be back here. I'm always very happy to come back in Tapei. So um, I'm, very ha I'm looking forward to this month here. So, yeah, the goal is to talk about MMP for foliations. So I talk about, maybe uh, you see exactly this title, I don't remember. Uh, two years ago here, for, I gave a few lectures about this topic. And interestingly, in the last two years, lots of things happen. So I'm going to talk about mostly what happened in the last two years. Um, so there will be, in case you were here two years ago, um, there will be very minimal overlapping. Nevertheless, I will try to make it, I mean, I will make it um, self-contained, of course. I will not give anything for granted. I will just remind you the basic notation and we start from there. OK, so two years ago I explained my personal motivation why I like foliations. Let me just say that um, foliations appear in many, many different contexts. But let's say, uh, so this is the introduction. Um, in Barashian geometry, they appear frequently for three different reasons. Uh, well, the first one is really about MMP, the standard MMP, namely abundance conjecture. I mean, the abundance conjecture say that, more, very, very vaguely, say that if kx is an f,
Danny Semiampo. And say that at the moment it's only through uh, characteristic zero. Well, many, many things are appearing positive characteristic, but let's say holes for uh, threefolds, of course, surfaces and threefolds. Uh, I mean, let's say dimension less or equal than three over C. And very, very recently, um, this is mostly due to Miyaoka. And very, very recently, it holds some partial version of this conjecture hold even in characteristic P due to um, Zhang and um, Chen Yang Shu. Um, and both these proofs, I mean, starting from Miyaoka, they use foliations. I'm not going to explain why, but uh, uh, foliation appear very, very naturally in, uh, in the proof that we know here. So this is one, my personal reason why I'm interested in uh, foliations. Then they appear very, very regularly when people study hyperbolicity. So uh, probably many of you know much more than I do here. But the idea is that if uh, X is a variety of general type, then we think that there are only finite, finitely many rational curves. So for instance, um, this is a, even in, for surfaces, this is a, maybe not finitely many, but they're containing a proper subvariety. Sorry. Uh, even for surfaces, this is not known. Um, but the idea is that if uh, X is a surface of general type, then we expect that uh, there exist only f there exist the most finitely many rational curves or you can extend this conjecture in many many other cases you can talk about entire curves and so on um, but even this it's open as far as i know i don't know exactly what is the progress about this conjecture but i think that the main results are due to mcquillan and bogomolov before him and again, so let me write maybe Bogomolov. And again, many, uh, and then again, uh, some of the main ingredients are foliations. And then the third reason, and maybe I should mention McQuillan because uh, he's the one that uh, is still trying to understand what, uh, how foliation help for hyperbolicity. Um, then the third application, but again, there are many, many more. Uh, I'm just considering those that somehow are related to uh, Brashian geometry. Are the appearing characteristic P. So this is thanks to Ekedal, I, I think. I mean, he was the first one that used foliations in characteristic P. Um, so maybe it's hard to tell exactly when they appear, because they really appear many, many times. But for instance, in Fujita types problems. I mean, that's one example. So for instance, if you try to show that Kx plus something ample, uh, suitably, sufficiently ample, is base point free. Uh, in characteristic zero, we use um, uh, non vanishing theorem. In characteristic P, many results follow from uh, using foliations, and uh, mostly picross foliations. Okay, and this is due to, well, again, there are many, many people, but I think that Ekedal was the one that started this story. And uh, maybe also I should mention Schaeffer Baron. Schaeffer Baron used foliation to classify threefolds, final threefolds, smooth final threefolds in characteristic P. So clearly, foliation play a big role in Brazilian geometry. By the way, I should say that um, many of the results in the minimum of the program I will give you for granted. But if I go too fast, please let me know. If you see something in Brazilian geometry that uh, is not familiar, I'm happy to spend more time on it. OK, so this was motivation. So let me start from the very beginning. So. The definition. So for the time being, I'm going to assume, uh, I will drop this assumption very, very soon. But for the time being, I will assume the tech is smooth. Smooth projective. So like uh, projective variety. 
And during these lectures, I will, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm actually sure, I will always, always work over the complex numbers. There are many, maybe I will explain something in, just for motivation about characteristic P. There are many results in characteristic P, but I will not have time to talk about it. I will only talk about complex numbers. Uh, and just for notation, I will always use n as the dimension. I mean, I will always denote by n the dimension um, of x. So, affiliation of rank p. And I will also use very often the word covrank. So by co-rank, I just mean uh, the dimension of x minus p. Um, it's a sheaf of rank p, coherent sheaf of rank p. Maybe I should say sub-sheaf, sorry. Tf of Tx. Satisfying two properties. I will. Uh, so maybe, sorry, I uh, denote the foliation by f. I will explain why I use this notation very, very soon. But let me say first what are the two properties. They are very standard. So it's close under Lie bracket. What does it mean? It means that, for instance, if you look at the map given by so let me write it um, so given by two vectors mapping to the initial commutator this map since I'm quotienting so this is uh, should be this element is in Tx but I'm quotienting by Tf what I'm trying to say is that this map is always zero. It's trivial. In other words, we should think of this element as to be an element inside Tf, not Tx. I mean, not only Tx. OK, I will explain why this is important. I will never use the word Lie bracket anymore. But I will explain why one is important very soon. And the second property is that um, Basically, this subshift is saturated, which means that uh, if we define, sorry, I should use the cursive. Uh, if you define nf to be the normal shift, which is given by tx over tf, then this shift must be torsion free. Okay. Let me explain why do I use the word tf and not f. The reason is very simple. It's because it's not f determining the foliation. I mean, it's, sorry, it's not tf determining the foliation. There could be the same shift, which define many, many different foliation. Why? Because it really depends on the embedding that you take. Different embedding here, different i will give different foliation. So this is a data. Tf is a data, but also i is a data. So in other words, we should think of, um, so this is a remark. We should think as f as the data Tf, but also i. I'm never going to use this notation. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not enough to think of f equal to Tf. You really need to think of how Tf inside, is inside Tx. I mean, of course, it's easy. Just take a product. Uh, um, of two varieties, so you can get a lot of different embedding of the same shift, but completely different foliations. Okay, so this was the first remark. Uh, before I explain why these two properties are important, let me fix some notation. So first of all, you should think of Tf to be a generalization of Tx. So this is just Instead of thinking of Tx alone, we think about subsheaves. And of course, in the minimum of the program, we use not quite Tx, but we use either omega 1x or canonical x, I mean Kx, sorry. So exactly in the same way, omega 1f will be denoted the, 
the dual of Tf. And also Kf denotes the divisor associated to uh, this shift. So you should think of this is the canonical divisor associated to f. OK, so what do we do in the minimum of the program? In the minimum of the program, what we do is to, um, to study how variety behave depending on kx. So the goal of these lectures is exactly to the same but for foliations. Um, um, namely, we study how foliation behave when depending on kf. And well, I'm going to comment uh, in a few minutes, but let me continue with the notation. So we will always talk about singularities. So the singular, the singular locus of f. Sorry if you see this, if you saw this before, but I need to define it once for all. It's the set of all the points x such that uh, the shift nf is not locally free at x. Of course, this is a closed subset of x. So the idea is that, um, so this is the singular locus. So let me be very vague. Let me try to explain what I'm, we are going to talk about in the next three lectures. So the idea is that exactly like varieties, similarly to varieties, we will assume that we will work with singular variations. What does it mean? It means that working with smooth varieties is not enough in the minimum of the program because it's not a good category from a Barashian geometry point of view. And similarly, with uh, foliation, we cannot work with smooth foliations because we'll see many, many examples. It's not um, a good uh, category, but we'll work with singular foliation. And the idea is that when, sorry, when the singularity is a mouse, Then the idea is that Kf behaves from many point of view, not of course all point of view, but in many point of view, uh, similarly to the canonical device of a, to the canonical divisor of a projective variety with mild singularities. So again, in the minimum of the program, what we do is to talk about canonical singularity, terminal singularity, and so on. And we study those varieties. And there are many properties that are true. For foliation, many things are very, very similar. So two things in particular are true. I mean, two things, sorry, not true, but uh, uh, we expect to be true. One thing is that uh, bend and break. So if, for, what does it mean? Exactly like, I'm not going to be precise now. I'll be precise later on today or maybe next time. But the idea is that if Kf is not an F, then F um, induces a rational curve. What does it mean? It means like uh, this is due to Mori. Um, any projective variety for which a projective, sorry, for which a canonical device is not an F always emits a rational curve. And th this is a conjecture, sorry. 
Uh, in for full issue, we expect to be true, and in many cases true, that if this device is non-F, then it should, there should be a rational curve. Of course, satisfying some other properties. But just the fact that there is a rational curve, it's important. And the second thing, which from my point of view, it's even more important, uh, no, sorry, it's equally important, is the MMP. So, let me just write is that if KF is split effective, maybe I will remind you later on what split effective means, uh, then there should be, again, this is a conjecture, then there should be a Barashian map such that, of course, more properties are true, but let me say for uh, such that um, if f prime is the induced foliation on x prime, then kx prime, kf prime is an f. So it's like, say, almost like, say, we kill all the rational curves which are negative with respect to kf. Okay, very, very briefly, uh, so this is the goal of the Miyamoto model problem for foliations. Very, very briefly, let me say the state of the art. Um, what do we know so far? So, of course, for curves, it's not interesting. So, for in dimension two, everything's okay. And this is what we talked about uh, two years ago. This is, maybe I should say, McQuillan. There are many people, but McQuillan is the main contributor. Uh, let me say that, uh, one more time, this is true over C. Strangely enough, in characteristic P, we still have no idea. I, I don't know why, but no one really asks uh, this question. Why? What, what happens in the minimal program I mentioned two for characteristic P? I have a student working on it, but um, it's not easy. I mean, uh, at least it's not obvious to us how to prove similar results as in this case. So both of these results are true in uh, OVC. Okay. In any dimension, but to be honest, I really have problem to understand the proof. Um, for p equal to one, um, so p remember is the rank. Um, again, by McQuillan, it should be okay. There is something to say, but almost okay. But still, uh, I'm not sure if I will ever talk about this because I probably don't understand the proof. And then, let's say that for n equal to three and p equal to two, then I think almost everything's okay. Um, we are getting very, very close. Um, so let me just say that Spicer uh, started this business and then we we, we carry out this program in collaboration with Spicer. So I will talk, since this one I already covered, and since this one I don't understand, I will talk mostly about this. Okay, so this is the introduction. So let me, let me say now a few words why this is a correct definition. So let me, let me keep the definition I'm going to erase this one. Um, no, we'd, actually, it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, we have talked only for a few minutes, but uh, since everything's new, it makes it's possible that uh, our proof works even for p equal to 1, but we didn't write it down, so I don't know to be honest. There are some problems, but we don't know. Yeah, no, we haven't worked out. We don't know. Our proof and the McQueen proof are completely, completely different. 
So uh, we haven't tried to see if our proof works for Pico to one yet. It's possible. I will talk about um, what are, why P equal to two, I mean why, sorry, maybe I should say instead of P equal to two, I should say Q equal to one, which of course is the same thing. But let's say that these methods generalize more, if there are any hope to generalize this, I think it works more suitably on um, co-rank one rather than P equal to two. And we will see why, I mean we'll see why many, many times. Okay, so let me go back to more technical being more technical. So let me go back to the definition of, of, um, um, of foliation. Why do we need this for definition? So in the definition of foliation, um, two it's easy to get. Can always be can always be achieved by taking a circulation. What does it mean? It means that if you take any subshift of the x, if it's not true that two is, I mean, if it's not true that n f is torsion free, then just take the saturation of the subshift. Uh, it will be still close under the bracket, and so. So you get it for free, pretty much. And why do we want this to be true? Well, two implies, it's actually almost equivalent. I should say that it's equivalent. It's the same as saying that the singular locus of f has co-dimension two, has co-dimension, sorry, at least two. So this is a bit like normal varieties, right? Normal varieties, first of all, given any variety, I can take a normalization exactly like I can take saturation. And also, normal variety have singularity of co-dimension two. Maybe it's not equivalent, but it doesn't matter. So, so whenever you have affiliation without any effort, you can always assume that the singular locus is co-dimension greater equal than two. So that's why we need two. Okay, so two is very, very natural. How about one? Why do we care about one? So one, it's a bit less uh, obvious, but it's a very, very, uh, tech, uh, um, standard result. It's called Frobenius theorem. And it's the reason why foliations are important, well behaved. So what does he say? He says that um, if uh, for any x inside uh, the smooth locus of f, There exists U open set, but not algebraic, not dense, uh, but analytic. And there exists a map phi from U to CQ. Such that pretty much the foliation is induced by this map. So such that um, if we take an F and we restrict it to U, this is nothing but the pullback of the tangent bundle of CQ. So in other words, uh, TF restricted to U is the relative tangent bundle. Okay, so let me draw a picture. Um, yeah, maybe let's do it here. So locally, around any point, as long as uh, this is very important, we'll talk about this uh, in the future, but we always, I mean, for Fermi's theorem to be true, um, this is important. So there's a map phi. Let's say this is CQ, but uh, of course in this example it's one dimensional. So, the fibers of this map 
co leaves. Leaves of the foliation. Um, what should I say? Okay, so this will be very important. And uh, although I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to sh show it, but if you drop this assumption, nothing is true. I mean, mean what the program is not true, bender break is not true. So clearly, foliation are much better behaved than any subsheaf of Tx. A subsheaf of Tx is called distribution. But those sheaves are not, I mean, not going to give you anything similar to the minimum model program. So this is the much, much better setup from our point of view. OK, very, very briefly. OK, I think I can delete the definition. So I can take a dual point of view. And since I'm going to do it every once in a while, uh, let me spend a few words on it. So instead of thinking of affiliation as, uh, so f induce a map of tf inside tx. But I can do the opposite. And uh, we say that uh, nf is the, is the co-kernel. But we can do the opposite also. Of course, we can take the dual. So we can, take, we can think of the dual of nf to be inside uh, omega 1 of x. By the way, everything I'm saying is true, even if x is singular, although, uh, normal, of course. And um, uh, of course, this is not anymore a vector, uh, sorry, this is not anymore a vector bundle, but uh, uh, everything holds true. And of course, this theorem will be true outside the singular locus of x in this generality. OK. So once we have this, we can take, so this is a shift of rank Q. So this one, we can take the Qth power, of course, the Qth wedge power of this. And this is inside omega Q of x. OK? So in particular, affiliation defines uh, I mean, this embedding defines a Q form, rational Q form, omega. But this omega is not random. I mean, the fact that uh, this is a foliation, So since f is a foliation, so I need to use um, uh, the fact that it's close under Lie bracket. It follows that uh, omega, locally, omega is equal to, it's decomposable. What does it mean? It means that uh, these are uh, one forms, rational one forms. This is not true in general, of course. If you any, have a, any Q form, it's not true that you can decompose it, even locally. But uh, since F is a foliation, this omega will satisfy this property. And actually, even more is true. Um, um, D omega i wedge omega is equal to 0 for any i. OK, this is just, the proof of this is just linear algebra. I'm not going to do it, but it's very easy. And if you want to have more, if you want to see the proof of this, there is a nice book by, uh, so it's a reference, Camacho, uh, Nato, um, wrote a book which has all this proof. But again, the proofs are very, very simple. It's just a purely linear algebra. OK, I wrote it in my notes, but I'm going to skip it. So, sorry, maybe I should say one remark. As I said, I'm, only, I'm mostly interested in uh, foliation of rank uh, 2 on a 3 photos. In other words, Q rank 1. So if Q is equal to 1, then omega, of course, is a one form, rational one form, such that, uh, well, this is true. 
We will see some example. But uh, when you think of affiliation, locally you just think of it to be a one form. Again, locally means analytic. So there are two ways to see it. Either to see it induced by a fibration or induced by one form. Okay, and of course, uh, defoliation means that uh, the fibers are um, hypersurfaces. That's why Q equal to one is special case. Okay, it's a fibration for which the fibers are hypersurfaces. Yeah, they're closed, that's right, yeah, sorry, yeah. Omega is closed, yeah. Okay. So just in terms of uh, definition, notation, or whatever. So we'll say that W is a subvariety is tangent tangent to F if um, if factors um, if T W factors through uh, Tf along uh, x minus singular locus of f. So what does it mean? So first of all, uh, all the definitions I'm going to give now are very, very similar to each other. But all the definition w will never be contained uh, uh, inside the singular locus of f, because otherwise this definition does not make any sense. So it means that, for instance, you could have a curve and uh, all the, at the general point, the tangent directions are given exactly by the tangent, uh, I mean, locally, uh, the tangent is given by some vector field. The, the subshift is given by some vector field. So these, are, uh, these directions are contained in TF. Okay, so this is uh, standard. So if not, if W is not tangent, We'll say that um, we say that it is transverse. Of course, it could be half transverse, half tangent. I mean, it could be that uh, it's a surface for which some direction of tangent, but we'll still call it transverse. Okay. Then we'll say that W is F invariant. So this is a bit confusing, but uh, I will use it all the time. If uh, we have a factorization so in other words, this the tangent band of W um, it's in the middle, factors through, I mean, it's, it's a factor, I mean, it's decomposed this uh, embedding. Of course, this is given by I, restricted to W. Okay, so for instance, what does it mean? It means that you should think of it to be exactly like the leaves here. There's almost no difference, except that uh, those are defined everywhere. The F invariant subvarieties are defined everywhere. Okay, so it's not only tangent, but it's the full leaf. Okay, so in other words, subvariety of anything F invariant is tangent, but it's not true the other way around. Okay, uh, and then one more word, but all these words are very, very similar to each other. Let me do it here. If S is a... Um, is, uh, um, F invariant hypersurface. Then it's called the separatrix. Okay, it's just a word. Uh, let me give a comment. Uh, usually, when I talk about F invariant, they're usually algebraic at least analytic. 
for separatrix in the third lecture, um, I might consider even formal hypersurfaces. And of course, it will be called formal separatrix. What does it mean? It means that, unfortunately, separatrix might, in some cases, we might need to talk about, it might be useful to talk about things which are only defined in a formal neighborhood of something. Uh, for us, it would be a curve. So given a curve, there could be, in some cases, there will be only some separatrices which are formal. Why is that? Because this curve could be contained in the single locus of uh, F. And this will be very important for us. But again, I'll talk about this in two lectures, I mean, in the last lecture. OK, so very briefly, how to construct examples of foliations? So any fabrication defines a foliation. So how does it work? Well, of course, I can take the tangent bundle of y, and this will be mapped into, I mean, Tx will map on this guy here, and then take the kernel. This would be given, this would give a subshift of Tx, of course. But in general, it's not saturated. Okay, so I need to take the saturation. Okay, let me give a very specific example. I'm sorry if you saw it. I mean, I'm sure you, some of you saw it before. Uh, but um, let's suppose that we have X is a surface. And the Y is a curve. The same can be true in any, for any dimension by taking uh, um, y a curve and x any dimension. So, of course, you have a foliation, but then it's easy to check that kf is equal to the relative canonical bundle, and I should stop here if I don't take the saturation. If I don't take the saturation, a very, very simple calculation shows that this is true. But since I need to take the saturation, I need to make sure that is, um, uh, the singularities appear in codimension one, uh, do not appear in codimension one. So the formula is this. I need to basically take care of multiple fibers where this vertical. And LD is the multiplicity, namely a star of P is equal to the sum of LD times D. So it's uh, the multiplicity of the fiber along D. Okay, so this is the formula. Okay, so the way to think about this, even in higher dimension, is that um, maybe there is a minimum of the program not only for Kx, but for all this. Even if there are no multiple fiber, this is interesting, right? Maybe there is a minimum of the program for Kx relative to Y. And it's strange that only in the last few years people have been studying this. I mean, uh, this is somehow a very, very natural question somehow. OK, that's my personal point of view. Um, OK, I need to talk about um, a generalization of this. Which we'll use all the time. So more in general, so let suppose that uh, x to y has connected be a morphism with connected fiber.
let's suppose that uh, oh sorry maybe I should say uh, example zero uh, stupid example but it's uh, I guess everyone knows but you can take uh, tf equal to tx right and then uh, f, uh, kf it's equal to kx. This is stupid, but just to show why the, I mean, why I'm using the word more general, more in general. Because I'm using, instead of f, instead of ky, f, sorry, instead of ty, I'm choosing any foliation f. So let's suppose that uh, f is a foliation of y. Uh, then uh, we have a map, of course, uh, f star of omega 1 x into omega 1 over y, right? And so, basically, uh, sorry, I need to assume something. This is important. Let's assume, yeah, thank you. Thanks. So let's assume that um, Two property, um, f of x, the image is not tangent. I, I'm not assuming, sorry, I'm not assuming, sorry, when I say connected fibers, I don't mean that it's surjective. I don't know how to call this thing, but uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's, uh, empty set is connected, I suppose. Uh, assume that f of x, and it will be clear in one minute why I need that. So let's assume that f of x is not tangent to f, And also f of x, sorry, is not contained inside the single locus of f or the single locus of x. So sorry, I say that x needs to be smooth at the beginning, but I also say that everything generalized to x singular. So if you assume that x is not singular, Sorry, and this is again y is not x, sorry. Then that's what you get. That's what we assume. Okay, then well just by taking the pullback. Um, F induces affiliation. which I'm going to call it f of x on x. Okay, just by using this. I mean, this is by looking from a dual point of view. Why? You can think of f and, f and star of f to be a subshift of here. So take the pullback and this will be defined. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very natural. So if you think it would be clear. And it will be also clear why the two properties will be satisfied. But we do need to take, but take a pullback and saturation. Okay, so what I'm going to write now is going to be important uh, for the future. Um, okay, let me write it somewhere else. So exactly like here, here we had to take saturation, right? Because if we didn't take saturation, this term wouldn't appear. But this term measures exactly uh, the bad locus. So what happens if you do the calculation? But the calculation is very simple. So for simplicity, let's assume q equal to 1, just for simplicity. Then what happens is that if, let me write it first, then I will explain. So if we define theta to be equal to n star of fx minus, uh, sorry, this is confusing. Uh, sorry. In general, when I use the script, this will deny it to the divisor. Okay, so I'm using the wrong notation. Sorry. 
for rank one, this is a shift of, of um, so if q is equal to one, and f is a shift of rank one. Okay, so an f would be just the divisor associated to this shift. So what I'm saying is very simple, but uh, it's good to distinguish uh, line bundles with divisor, I suppose. Sorry. So if I take um, this divisor, then this is always effective. Okay. What I'm trying to say here, it's very, very simple, but it would be it would be useful in the future. Um, if, if we didn't have to take the saturation, if it was already saturated, then theta would be zero. I'm not going to write it, but uh, you should think of it, of theta, to be how far is uh, the shift induced by F saturated. If it's saturated, then there is no theta. But effective, it's going to be very important. Let me write another formula. So not that. Uh, oh, th thanks. Thank you. Uh, actually, what? Um, yeah, it's very very confusing, right? So yes, yeah, sorry. Um, let's be. So since it's a device, I shouldn't to take dual, but I should take this. Sorry. Ah uh, yes, thanks. Yep. Or maybe I should say, let me write it, uh, C, since I made a mess, C1 of NF dual minus C1. Again, the line, the shift, if, if X is smooth, there are line bundles. So uh, it does, uh, it's not very different. Sorry, this is the correct one. OK, uh, so what did I want to say? Oh, okay, note that uh, n star of f is equal, oh, again, sorry, c1 of n star, uh, c1 of uh, this guy. Uh, it's good to take the sign, it's correct, so I hope I'm not doing mess. Is equal to kx minus kf. Okay, this is obvious. I mean, this follows from the sequence. Uh, uh, let me write it here, uh, 0, tf, tx, nf. But if you combine, and we will do it uh, uh, maybe next hour, if we combine these two formulas together, you get something useful, strangely enough. Okay? I'm not going to do it because it's obvious, but uh, uh, I will do it, uh, I will write it down explicitly in a few minutes. So let me call star this formula. I'm sorry that uh, I will recall star in about uh, half an hour or something like that, but I'm not going to write it again. Okay, so when do we care about this? So we can take care about this, for instance, it's very interesting because in two different, completely different contexts we care about this. Uh, that, for instance, if f is birational, this is important. Or if f, it's an embedding, this is important. They're completely different contests, but both cases, uh, we will use it all the time, okay? That's why I say it, it's not subjective, because very, very often what we will do is to take an hypersurface and, um, and consider the embedding of this hypersurface. So it's not, I'm not gonna assume that, uh, um, Okay, so uh, I, this is the end of this section. Maybe it's also a good time, sorry, it's a good time to take a break. I'll talk about singularities later on. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, not this one, but this one. Where is it? Yeah, this one. Oh, sorry. Yes, otherwise, I might say something. <laughs> Because abundance is not good. Yeah, so you could have uh, here, you can but not some more. So abundance. Actually, yeah. So did you hear anything from uh, Charles Kuhl, right? Uh, right? From the Royal Society. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. When are they going to give you an answer? Uh, I'm not sure. So there will be many people from Japan. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's the one that organized the whole thing. Okay. I didn't know almost anything. Yoshinori will be there. And also Takagi is in London for three months. No? Yeah, even now. Actually four months, so even now. So he will be there of course. So yeah, if you if you if you go to my web page. You will see the information. Oh, okay. for, for, the, for the workshop. For this workshop. <laughs> when is it? 28th of May. Oh. For four days. Oh. 
It's like it's this very similar to the yeah, yeah. Usually, you don't care about this information. You care about the I'm number of people. So, yeah. so yeah. things that shouldn't be there. I mean, the one below should be more, it will be more natural. But of course, the one below it will be more. It's not about this information. It's more like a relaxed movements. Yeah. It's in the next one. But it's like a For instance, you can ask. Uh, Oh, for instance, for surface, you can see the surface is, if you look at the resolution operation, the dual graph is incredibly similar. I mean, it disappears in this way. Oh, can I? So, yeah, it's very, very similar. Part of the talk. Thank you.
last, last lecture, I will talk about uh, MNT. Okay, so any questions? So do we know uh, uh, anything about the weaker version of uh, resolution of singularity by replacing um, uh, canonicity with, uh, with uh, the property of being uh, the, the critical? And um, so another question. So is it true that for any uh, for any um, projective variety, there's um, uh, one rank one for there always exists a rank one uh, foliation? And you also say that McQuillan prove um, um, so prove that uh, Ben and break is true for uh, rank one uh, foliation. So it means also that uh, you will give a systematic way to produce uh, rational curves on on every variety. Ah. Okay, thank you.